Hello and welcome to Lecture 5 of the Energy Unit of Phys 1104. And in this lecture we're meeting the Law of Conservation of Energy, which is only the most important law in all of physics. Our original hypothesis a few lectures ago was that whenever kinetic energy is lost in a system, it's transformed into internal energy. And we've also seen that internal energy can be transformed into kinetic energy. And we put forth this hypothesis originally to imply that the energy in our system never gets destroyed. It just gets transformed into other forms in our system. Well, could it be destroyed outside our system? Well, you can actually argue from our hypothesis as it already exists that it can't be. So here's the argument. If we think of our system as the spring and the cart, then we know how this works. The energy bar chart is already there. We see the internal spring energy in this system being converted into kinetic energy. But now let's think differently with just the spring in our system. So we know that all that's going on in our system is that we have a bunch of spring energy initially, and finally the spring energy is all gone. It's left the system. But we already know exactly where it went because we've already analyzed the situation with the spring and the cart both in our system. We know that that energy ended up in the cart. And if we ignore all the rest of the energy in the environment, there's probably a little bit of energy out there in the whole rest of the universe, let's just ignore all that and focus on the cart, then this pair of energy bar charts is describing the whole process. But you see, we've just said we know where the energy goes when it's leaving the system here, and we know it isn't destroyed. But what we're seeing here is that we could redefine our system to encompass other things, and because we're implying that inside our system energy is never destroyed, well, we can define our system any way we want. And so we are implying with our hypothesis that energy must be indestructible. So I'll just state now that we have a law of conservation of energy. We believe that energy cannot be created or destroyed, but we can transfer it back and forth from one object to another, and we can convert it from one form into another. And this is an incredibly well-tested law. It's well over 100, 150, perhaps 200 years old in some forms, and it's been tested in all sorts of different situations. And it really is almost certainly the most important result in the entire history of physics, in particular because it has enormous implications for all sorts of other disciplines other than physics. Energy comes up everywhere, and just about everything you study, certainly in the sciences, but not just in the sciences, is going to have some connection to energy. An obvious one, because humans are voracious users of energy, is that it has big political and economic implications. Look at this chart from the Energy Information Association of the U.S. showing energy uh, production and consumption in the United States, and I want to point you at the fact that whoever made this figure was very careful with the thickness of the lines to show that there are inputs of energy into the system that is apparently the United States, and there are outputs, but there's no creation or destruction going on. So they understand energy as a conserved extensive quantity. But there are lots of other places where energy shows up where maybe you might be a little surprised to see it. It's all over the place in biology, both at the level of the organism and how an organism takes in energy from its environment and uses it for various biological functions, and also at the ecosystem where energy comes in largely from the sun to an ecosystem and you can think of it as flowing through the ecosystem and eventually all ending up at, as heat which eventually gets radiated back to space. I'm going to end the unit with 
an example, working a problem that's fairly simple but is going to illustrate a lot of the sorts of points that are going to come up as we go forward in the course and work more and more with energy. So let's think about a car and it's got an inertia of about 1,500 kilograms. That's pretty typical for a mid-size car. We're going to think of it starting at rest and speeding up to 30 meters per second. And we're going to think about how much energy that takes, and in particular we can work out how much gasoline is burned just going up to 30 meters per second. Now we're going to be neglecting lots of things. There's air drag that we're not going to consider, friction with the road, all kinds of things that by the end of the course you'll know how to put into this calculation. But at this point we're going to ignore them so that it all goes simply. So I've written down some numbers that we're going to find useful and I'll explain how we use them as I go through. And the only other things we're really going to need are the idea that energy is a conserved quantity and the equation for kinetic energy, which we certainly know. So the first thing we should do is really think about our system. So I want to think of the car and the gas in its tank as our system. And so in particular think about whether there are any inputs of energy or outputs of energy for this system. Now of course if it was say being towed by another car you might expect that that car is helping speed it up and so putting energy into the system and so on. But this is a closed system here. We have no outside influences that are putting energy in in any form. And so we are going to produce kinetic energy, right? As the car speeds up, it's going to gain kinetic energy. It has no kinetic energy at the start. So I'm going to write a Ki here and just put a line down here at zero. But it will have some final kinetic energy, which we can calculate. And I'm going to put a bar here like this to show that there's some final kinetic energy. Well, that energy has to come from somewhere, and I think we all know where it comes from. It comes from the gasoline in the tank. So there is some chemical energy initially. And is that it? Is that the only thing that happens? Well, you may know, of course, if you drive and then you open up your hood and put your hand very unwisely on the engine, you're going to burn yourself. A lot of the energy from the burning of the gasoline is not used to push the car forward. It's converted into thermal energy. It warms things up, including the car. And in fact, the majority of it ends up as thermal energy. And so our initial chemical energy must be about the sum of these two. I guess I haven't given myself enough room. And we can now write a conservation of energy equation. In fact, the energy bar chart has practically already done it for us. If we interpret this line here that's indicating the break between initial and final as where we should put our equals, because we're saying this is a closed system, and so our initial energy should equal our final, all we have is some E chem initially. I'm going to ignore that zero kinetic energy at the start, which becomes final kinetic energy and thermal energy at the end. So that is our conservation of energy equation, and that k is just going to be a half mv squared, where we know the m and we know our speed. But we need another piece of information, and that's the proportion here. We can now calculate kf, right? That's easy. kf is just a half 1500 kilograms. 30 meters per second squared. I'm not even going to calculate it though. I'm going to just leave it here for the moment. I'll put it in eventually. But what we do know is something called the engine efficiency. And 
a reasonably typical energy, uh, an engine efficiency for a car is about 25%. And that means of the energy you get from the gasoline, only 25% of it goes into actually making the car move. All the rest goes to thermal energy. That may seem like an incredibly low efficiency to you, but that's actually pretty typical for modern cars. For older cars, it would be even lower. So that tells us that, what that tells us is that our um, final kinetic energy is only 25% of our initial chemical energy. This is now enough information. This equation is now telling us where the rest goes. So let's work from here because what we really want is that chemical energy. So there we go. Our chemical energy in the end is just our kinetic energy final, or sorry, our initial chemical energy is our final kinetic energy over 0.25, or in other words, it's four times our final kinetic energy. And so we can find our chemical energy. It's just four times a half mv squared. So I'll just do slight simplification. So if you plug those numbers into your calculator, your calculator is going to tell you that that is about 2.7 times 10 to the 6, and that's kilogram meter squared per second squared, that is joules, which is a pretty big amount of energy, right? That's 2.7 megajoules, but gasoline has a pretty high energy density. This is the amount of energy per liter of gasoline. And so if you just look at the units, if we simply want liters of gasoline, we need to take our energy in joules and divide by our energy density in joules or megajoules or whatever per liter, and that's going to give us something in liters. You don't need an equation. The units and doing a unit analysis tell you how to do it. And so there we go. Our volume of gasoline burned just speeding up from rest to highway speed. So it's not going to be a lot of gas, but we have 2.7 times 10 to the 6 joules over 33 megajoules per liter. So that's 3.3 times 10 to the 7 joules per liter. Joules will be gone and we'll be left with liters. And that is about 0.08 liters. So almost a tenth of a liter just getting going and up to highway speed, which, you know, tells you why stopping and starting repeatedly in, high, in uh, city traffic burns so much gas.